Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I begin a huge ranking of every Agatha Christie murderer, which is really quite accurate. I, I did have a few rules here I'd like to establish. First off, major spoilers ahead, it's unavoidable. Second, I didn't include some of the more thrillery novels, and while they do have murders in them, it's not really a murder plot in the traditional sense. So there is no Big Four, The Secret of Chimneys, Destination Unknown, They Came to Baghdad, or Passenger to Frankfurt characters, and even if I did include them, they would all be pretty much near the bottom anyway. I did include accomplices, even those who didn't outright commit a murder, so as long as they were part of the plot ahead of time. So some people who were left out include Valerie from Hickory Dickory Dock, Lorraine Wade from The Seven Dials Mystery, and Mrs. Foliat from Dead Man's Folly. And while they were in on the plot, so to speak, it was more so tangential and afterwards than helped plan it directly. I did include characters who murdered other characters, even if they weren't the main culprit, so to speak, of a particular novel, and that includes everyone from And Then There Were None and people like Mrs. Lorimer from Cards on the Table. I didn't include those who killed the murderer in self-defense, such as Hori from Death Comes as the End, or the possibility of Jason Rudd from The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side, who may or may not have been a murderer himself. It's not really explained. And there are some other characters not included if their role in the murder was just very small, questionable, or simply not important enough to the main plot. The final thing is that I separated murderers from accomplices, so people like Simon and Jackie from Death on the Nile are ranked separately. There is one exception to this, and that is everyone in Murder on the Orient Express, because they function as one individual body. And many of the main characters I decided to include are subjective. I think some viewers may say I shouldn't have left someone out, or I shouldn't have included someone. I did initially wind up with 90-something, so I did try to stretch it out to an even 100. Now, how did I rank these characters? I had a few criteria. I am ranking them based on the brilliance of their plot primarily. I also love a good ruthless murderer, someone who has no shame and holds no bars. They mislead and incriminate others. They trick Poirot or Miss Marple or whoever the detective character is. They're greedy. They desire their own gain over everything else on Earth. And I am assessing these characters as murderers. And as you'll see, some of them are good characters, but they may not have had the best plot in place, etc. And they may not have made for the best murderers. I also like to see good character development. Any murderer who is sort of weak-willed is not likely to be very high on the list. And before I begin, make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. And as always, I will start at the very bottom with the very worst Agatha Christie murder is, not coincidentally, from the worst Christie novel, in my opinion, Poster of Fate, and that is Iris M And what is there to say about her? She's barely in the book. Not an interesting character, has no motivation, no plan. I barely remembered her name. She's in like 10 pages of the book and does really very little in them. I just have like nothing to say about her because she's just a totally nothing character. She's not developed or even anything remotely close to that. She's very clearly the worst Christie killer by far and comes in at last place at number 100. Number 99, a slightly more memorable killer but heavily flawed from another book I don't like and that is Dolly Preston Gray from Elephants Can Remember. And I've said this many times that I don't like mentally ill killers in mystery novels, especially as something along the lines of Dolly here, where she's not planning murders. She just kills in psychotic outbreaks. She murders her sister, her child, and probably some other people. We know very little about her. We never even meet her. She's just simply not interesting or well portrayed, so she comes in at number 99. At number 98, and this is a prime example of what I mean when I say I'm assessing these murderers as murderers and not as characters, and here we have Miss Chadwick from Cat Among the Pigeons. And I think Miss Chadwick is a good character, but she doesn't make a good killer. 
I never really understood her motivation for cautioning Miss Vansittart, and we're told she had a momentary breakdown when seeing her colleague rummaging through the locker. I don't know if I really buy that, given Miss Chadwick's characterization throughout the rest of the novel, and she never really had a plan before or after the murderer, and there was just really something I could have done without in the book, so Miss Chadwick, not a good murderer, here at number 98. At number 97, and what do you know, the other culprit from Elephants can remember, General Ravenscroft. The general is a little better than Dolly. He does at least concoct a plot, but it's not a very good one. I saw through it immediately, and again, we never meet him in the flesh, so there's not much characterization going on. He commits suicide after killing Dolly, and it's a little grain of something for me that puts him above the likes of like Dolly or Miss Chadwick or Iris Mullins, but he's simply not interesting at all. His plan is pretty terrible. I mean, then again, I mean, it's not like he's a mass killer who's coming up with these ingenious ideas. That's not really his point, but still, the point remains the same, so he comes in here at number 97. At number 96, again, another character that we never see in the flesh and know very little about, but this person is significantly more important to the book they appear in, and that is Isaac Morris from And Then There Were None. And Isaac Morris does have some things going for him. He is in the plot of the story, I and mean, he's a big character, technically speaking. He's the voice on the gramophone, and he seems to be at least something of a charlatan, with very small hints of that ruthlessness I like to see in a murderer. But I mean, first of all, lots of anti-Semitism thrown his way. It's not good. It's not really a good portrayal of someone, especially like the for the murderer character, sort of like connecting deviants or whatnot. And his status as murderer is somewhat dubious. I and mean, he's a drug dealer whom Wargrave considered liable for the death of a friend. And I get that, but it's not really of the same caliber as many Christie killers. And on top of that, we know almost nothing about him, so he falls near the bottom of the list here at number 96. Number 95, I have the lowest ranked accomplice to a murderer, and that is Valerie Bland from The Clocks. And Mrs. Bland, appropriately named, is just simply totally forgettable. She does at least play along with the plot, though, but she, and she's largely a compliant tool for her husband and her sister to use for their own gain. She's very clearly not cut out for the role as a killer, and she's very free and loose with information. She gets a lot of things wrong, and she's not developed or at least even interesting, certainly the least interesting member of this killing trio. And the only reason why I remembered her first name of Valerie is because that's actually a plot point because the real heiress is also named Valerie. But other than that, I probably would have forgotten all about her. So she comes in at number 95. And number 94 is another accomplice, and I've never liked this character, although he is a lot more active in the book than anyone I've already talked about, and that is Edgar Lawson from They Do It With Mirrors. And I do think Edgar could be a little higher just based on his importance to the story, but he's just simply not a very good murderer. He's very over-the-top, dramatic, very clearly a scoundrel. He's also basically a patsy for his father. I mean, he basically just has no free will whatsoever. He doesn't plan anything on his own. He just does whatever he's told. I would have no faith in Edgar to pull off a murder all by himself. It's very hard for me to take him seriously, which I mean, I guess we're not supposed to, but in that case, his behavior is just simply not good obfuscation. He's not particularly ruthless either, so he falls near the bottom of the list to here at number 94. At number 93, and I can't even believe this person is even this high, and that is Lucky Dyson from A Caribbean Mystery. And this is barely a murder plot, but she did technically kill her husband Greg's first wife and tricked Ed, uh, Ed Hillingdon into helping her, apparently. And we don't see any of this. It's all just simply told to us. But she does technically qualify for a murderer, and the only reason why she's this high on the list is because I do think that she at least possesses a certain amount of ruthlessness that I like to see in a Christie killer which is something, but we don't even really know what her plot is. It had something to do with like pills or medication or something like that. I wish we did know more about it, but she's also just simply a nothing character, barely in the book, whom we know so little about. So she comes in here at number 93. And number 92 is also like a somewhat similar character when you really think about it, and that is Elvira Blake from At Bertram's Hotel. And I did debate over this one because I think Elvira has a lot in common with some murderers I have very near the top. She's this sort of ruthless, femme fatale-esque like character. But the reason why I put her here is because she's the worst iteration of this character. 
She tries to manipulate people and fails. Her murder is not only really unnecessary, but very poorly executed as well. And she needs her mother's help to get away with it. This is another one. I just don't have much faith to pull off a good plot. And on top of that, again, she's not very interesting. She's very much a static, dull character, lacking quite a bit of nuance that some of these other femme fatale-like killers possess. So I put her towards the bottom at number 92. At number 91, and this is sort of a big one from a very popular novel, but one that I always think just simply fell flat, and that is Kirsten Lindstrom from Ordeal by Innocence. And I barely know anything about Kirsten. She's not in the book that much, certainly not as much as I think readers would assume. We know almost nothing about her. We do know that she apparently cares for the her children she takes care of, but she also then tries to murder Tina, so that part of her is questionable. And I really never understood why she killed Rachel Argyle when she could have just stolen the money and given it to Jacko. And I don't really buy that she fell in love with Jacko, whom she basically raised as her own son. I feel as if Kirsten was a missed opportunity for Christine in this book, where I think she very much could have been an all-time great murderer, but she's simply not. I don't care too much for her murder plans as well. I mean, she kills Rachel and Philip quite violently, and not in any like particularly clever way. She sort of gets by through sheer luck rather than her own ingenuity. She's very lucky that Jacko doesn't incriminate her when he's arrested. Now, I did appreciate her not confessing when she found out Jacko was married. I think that's a nice little character development for her, but it's really the only thing she has going for her. So I put Kirsten Lindstrom here at number 91. Number 90 is a character I barely remember, and that is Moira Nicholson from Why Didn't They Ask Evans. This is yet another accomplice who is fairly underdeveloped, and to be fair, much of Moira's low ranking here is largely because I just don't care for this book as much as I do for like the adaptation, but she does have some things going for her. I do think there's a bit of ruthlessness in her as she does try to incriminate and murder other people, but she's very sloppy and overall just simply not that interesting, so I have her at number 90. Number 89, a somewhat similar character and that is Ada Mason, a.k.a. Kitty Kid, who is the accomplice in The Mystery of the Blue Train. And Ada is the maid to Ruth Kettering, but in reality she is a male impersonator and conspirator in the jewel theft ring. I always found this aspect of her fun, but in terms of the book, she's simply not that exciting, nor is she particularly cunning. She does betray her employer, employer and deceive the police, which is something, and I do think she has a knack for lying, but she's simply not up to Christie's usual quality of killer characters, so she comes in at number 89. Number 88 is the final in this trio of women accomplices ranked this low, and that is Mrs. Rogers from And Then There Were None. And I'll do a video or video on, on some th theories I have about Christie novels down the road, but I have this opinion that the Rogersers are actually innocent of suffocating their employer. But anyway, for this list, I'm going to assume they are guilty, and it's somewhat lost that Mrs. Rogers is not really in the book that much. She's whisked away after the gramophone recording goes off, and we actually see less of her than we do of Marston, who dies before her. And that is Mrs. Rogers a little underdeveloped, but even then, Christy does such good work with characters in this book that it's not really noticeable. I do feel like I know who Mrs. Rogers is, at least. She's largely controlled by her husband, and I think she functions well in that role. But the problem is that that role is just simply not much. She doesn't really interact with the other guests. She's just there. But I do find a believable in this role as a submissive wife to an abusive husband, which is more than I can say about anyone else I've talked about. So she comes in at number 88. Number 87 is Christie's first female murderer in a novel, at least, and that is Marta Dubray from Murder on the Links, remembering that Evie Howard technically did not physically kill Mrs. Inglethorpe in The Mysterious Affair of Styles. And I found Marta Dubray to be very disappointing. I, I never found her particularly interesting as a character, and even less so as a murderer. We're supposed to believe she's this like ruthless, money-hungry woman, but she just comes across as flat. I, I don't find her convincing of a murderer, especially in the manner we're supposed to believe how she acted. 
Now, I do think her plan was very cunning where she murders Paul Renault while he's faking his own murder. She does display some ruthlessness and intelligence, but I just simply didn't find her that interesting or that convincing. And she kind of blended in with the other characters, specifically the twins. I, for whatever reason, I kept getting her mixed up with the twins. So Marta Dubray comes in at number 87. Number 86, and this is another one where the character is good, at least very spectacular, actually. But as a murderer, I have a lot of issues, and that is Gladys Martin from A Pocket Full of Rye. And the reason why she's this low is because she's also not technically the true killer here. She's tricked into murdering Rex Fortescue by poisoning his marmalade that she thinks is a truth serum. Now again, I find her character to be one of the best in Christie, but she doesn't have that murderer's heart. She didn't intend to kill anyone. She's merely a tool used by Lance to get his way. She lacks an intelligence, and she's just so easily manipulated and deceived by Lance. She doesn't really stand a chance, and once the murder happens, she just falls to pieces. She has no idea what to do, and very likely would have incriminated herself had she not been murdered. She also makes herself quite an easy target for the murderer as well. She's a fantastic character, but as a murderer, she really just can't cut it. So I put Gladys here at number 86. At number 85 is the other murderer from Why Didn't They Ask Evans, Roger Bassington French. And again, not the most riveting character, but certainly one who I do find to be ruthless. He'll stop at nothing for his own personal gain. He pretends to be a dying man so he can forge a will. He steals the photograph off of the dead body by the cliffs. I always thought it was funny how he escapes and essentially leaves Moira to be captured on her own. I don't have much to say about Roger Bassington French. He is a step above the rest in terms of his like true evilness, but still not particularly interesting or memorable, so I placed him at number 85. Number 84 I have from Hickory Dickory Dock, Nigel Chapman. And Nigel is clearly not a well-developed character. It didn't really seem like Christie put much effort into his design. He does murder four people, but none of those murders I thought were like, intriguing. I wasn't impressed with Nigel's killing skills. They seemed very haphazard, not well-planned, and he just seemed to skate by for a while through no doing of his own. He can't keep his allies on his side like Valerie who betrays him at the end or Pat who is supposed to be in love with him but he still wants to tell the police about the missing poison even when he tells her not to. I just found him very sloppy and he does some strange things like removing light bulbs so no one can identify him as if that would really work. I just find him pretty lackluster but he does possess a certain amount of ruthlessness that I like to see so it was enough to put him this high at number 84. At number 83 is a rare male accomplice, although I guess this one technically committed the murders, and that is Victor Drake from Sparkling Cyanide. And Victor Drake is an unusual character. He is the one who technically kills Rosemary and George by posing as a waiter and poisons the champagne, but it's very clear to me that Ruth is the mastermind and Victor is just the tool in which Ruth carries out her plans. And Victor himself isn't that great a character. We barely see him. And when we do, it's when we think he's the waiter. We don't ever see Victor as Victor. And everything we know about him is simply told to us. But I do think he's a little more vibrant, a little more memorable than anyone else I've talked about. So I put him at number 83. At number 82, a somewhat similar character in my opinion. And that is Josiah Bland from The Clocks. And Josiah Bland is barely more memorable than his wife, but I do think he has some positives. He is much more ruthless than the other killers I've talked about. He's willing to go to great lengths to claim money that's not his and use his wife to do so. Clearly doesn't care about her. And he kills two people, one in a tube station, which is the kind of risk I like to see. And to be fair, we don't really know if it was him or Miss Martindale who killed Mrs. Rival, but I think we can assume it was Mr. Bland. He's greedy and corrupt, but again, he's not the mastermind of the plot, and he is something of a bumbling idiot. He does too much that ruins his chances of getting away with murder. He also has to rely on his wife, who is clearly not up to the task, and on top of that, he's just simply not a riveting character, so I have him at number 82. At number 81 is who I believe is the highest ranked of what I call these invisible accomplices, these characters who aren't really major characters in the book, but do serve as part of the villainous team. And this one is sort of an asterisk, and that is Gerda Blunt from One Two Buckle My Shoe. And we barely know anything about Gerda Blunt, but, and this is why she's a special case here, is I actually do know her quite well as the fake Maybell Sainsbury Seal. 
as Gerda Blunt, her true identity, she is a nothing character. But the reason why I have her this high is because as Miss Sainsbury Seal, she is far more interesting and ruthless as a character. She is her husband's accomplice, but she does commit a murder herself. She does murder the real Maybelle and participates in the Morley murder. And we don't know much about her, but from her actions, she seems like she's pretty greedy and ruthless killer. Very competent as well. She'll do anything to protect her husband's fortune, including murdering innocent people like Morley and like Maybelle. I just wish we got to know her better because I think there is a better killer brewing in here, but it's simply not on the page, so I can't put her any higher than here at number 81. At number 80, a very different character, and that is Jimmy Thesiger from the Seven Dials Mystery. He's a very affable yet somewhat roguish young man. I liked his character over the course of the novel. He murders at least two people, and he's really after the Seven Dials Club and the secret formula. Remember, the Seven Dials is still mostly a thriller novel. It did seem as if Jimmy wasn't totally sure of himself. Battle even says he does certain actions like removing one of the alarm clocks just to see if it means anything. I do think there is like a grain of a good killer in there, but it simply didn't flourish as much as I would have liked. With a little more cunning, he could have been a couple of spots higher, but he lacks a bit of that something special, so he comes in at number 80. At number 79, another person from And Then There Were None, and that is Mr. Rogers, the butler. And again, my theory of the Rogers as being innocent does not apply here. And he's probably my favorite Christie Butler, although there is some competition. I also believe he's the only true butler in a Christie novel to have committed a murder, outside of like unusual situations like a three-act tragedy and murder on the Orient Express. I always like Rogers, as a, but as a murderer, it is a bit difficult to see. We don't spend a lot of time with him, and everything we know about him comes from other characters. So we should take that with a grain of salt. All the talk about Rogers dominating his wife and forcing her to participate in the murder of Miss Brady is simply something conjured up by the likes of Bloor and Wargrave. If I'm being honest, I simply don't see that in Rogers. I love the way Rogers, however, maintains the perfect butler persona, even to the point where he willingly separates himself from the group to perform his duties, which directly leads to him getting murdered. But as a murderer, it's a bit iffy, so we have him at number 79. Number 78 is a killer whom we know so little about, and that is Mrs. Lorimer from Cards on the Table. Uh, we don't even know what the murder plot was here. We do know she killed her husband. We don't know how or why. But what propels her this high on the list is that she's obviously a very competent murderer, very calculating as evidenced by her bridge scores. She gets away with it. She apparently never came under suspicion, and only Shaitana knows or believes the truth, and Poirot finds her very formidable, as a suspect at least. And it seems that because she's willing to sacrifice herself to save Anne, she does possess some regret over her crime, which is not something I really look for in a good murderer. I do think she's a very cunning and very cold individual that I like to see in a Christie killer, but it's really a lack of further plans and a lack of knowledge on what she actually did that forces me to put her here at number 78. At number 77 is a murderer that I wasn't too impressed with, and that is Bella Tanyos from Dumb Witness. And Bella falls into this category of murderers who ironically lack the killer instinct. She murders her aunt via phosphorus poisoning and attempts to frame her husband. She continues to incriminate her husband by claiming he's abusive to the children. She murders for money here, but to me, there was just something lacking in her character. I don't think she owned her role as a murderess as well as I would have liked her to. She commits suicide when she's exposed, and her attempts to murder her husband do seem a bit clumsy and a bit much of an overreach here. I never truly felt she had a great plan or was a top-notch killer, despite some of her actions indicating so. So I place Bella Tanios here at number 77. And at number 76, the final killer for this video is another similar person, and that is Louis Saracold from They Do It With Mirrors. And again, Louis murders three people to cover his embezzlement scheme and lets his wife and everyone else believe she's being poisoned. Keep in mind that he legitimately loves her. He also drags his son into the murder plot, and all of these things are signs of a great killer, but I just didn't feel it with Louis Saracold. Like, again, I don't think he owns it. He seems very wishy-washy about things, and he's also simply not that interesting of a character. And his murder plans aren't exactly the best demonstration of intelligence. A number of people figure him out very quickly, and he also can't embezzle without getting caught, so I think number 76 is about right for him. And that's it for this video. 
Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. Next week, I finish out the bottom half of the list with killers ranked numbers 75 through 51, so stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.